getting people to buy something that you make is never easy. And uh, you may think that what you make is good, but it probably isn't. You have to sort of outpace your mistakes by getting people to buy something that is sort of sawdust and broken dreams compared to what you want it to be. Uh, other than that, I mean, it's easy. Hey there, friend. This is Stephanie Krevins, and you are listening to the Mid-Level Leaders Hot Mess Hotline, where we bring you into conversations with CEOs so that you can learn to think like an entrepreneur with strategy, with focus, with innovation. My guest today is Dr. Kevin Burkopes. He is the CEO and founder of Crossroads, where they have been experimenting with the operating system of how education is designed and deployed for more than 15 years. His pragmatic approach to education was built through experience, teaching at all levels throughout the U.S. education system. He has received numerous national awards for his research and leadership, including the prestigious Indianapolis Business Journal's 40 Under 40 in 2018. He has amazing experience that I want you all to learn from. Not only does he have the street cred of studying applied and theoretical mathematics while continuing to extend his professional teaching experiences, he has a PhD from Purdue University, but he's also studied in the classroom. For six years, Kevin experimented with the Learning Commons model in higher education alongside a talented team of undergrads and graduate students. And this success in this work led to the creation of Crossroads Education in 2016 and is now scaled to work in the entire K through 16 sector in Indiana. Friends, I want you to listen into this conversation. And the thing that is my biggest takeaway from this conversation is when Kevin says, being incredibly practical is incredibly radical. Let's dig in, my friend. Let's get started. Let's dig in. So, Kevin, tell us about your hot mess, man. So, our work is is interesting because it's it is a balance between nonprofit and for profit work. So, my background is a PhD in mathematics. Um, I'm okay. a machine learning expert. Software is part of what we do, but we realized a long time ago uh, through awesome sets of mistakes that <laughs> software is and has its place in education, but re- education is relationship based. If you don't have humans making relationships, you don't have education. So software plays a role. That role is of predominantly consuming data, understanding it, maybe scheduling, doing the sorts of things and, and making good decisions and you know, getting those ready for humans to go and you know, build relationships with kids or other adults. If you can't operationalize the professional services side of things, then the software doesn't do anything. You make a lot of money, things fizzle out, that's ed tech for you. Uh, We don't Hmm. care about those approaches. We care about the approach of scaling equity. The only way to do that is to understand that the system was built not for equity. So it's really working great for what it was designed to do, which was keep certain people in positions of of resource and power and systematically depress others. You know, if you're born into a system right now, like ours, where you don't win the lottery of who you were born to, you have very little capability of removing yourself from the life you were born into. I have a problem with that. I've won the lottery Mm -hmm. uh, with who I was born to and what I look like. And I recognize that mainly through my own education and traveling and and understanding those things. But so that's, that's our fight, right? Our fight is the system. We have to create a new system that operationalizes the mess behind this is that the system doesn't want you. They don't want you to be successful because there are a lot of millions of people actually who their entire livelihoods are based on that system staying the same. Yes. People like to lament about the the plight of the education system, but very few actually want to change it. Or, there's there's uh, a lot at stake when they lose their power. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And you know, to the to your point of the the very idea of fundamentally shifting a system means that we have to uh, call a lot of people's babies ugly. Yes. Uh, and then they're the ones that we're supposed to be helping. And usually, when you call my baby ugly, I don't like you. And, uh, and how that, how that tends to work. So I guess the, it's like the 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 ego gets triggered or something. It's like the ego gets, it's it's super ego. Um, you know, and everybody has a great and and solidified opinion on what needs to be done in education. Cause we all, you know, went through our own education. So we have perfectly legitimate uh, opinions on, Uh on how things work. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't see other industries having that. Right. So just because I, uh, you know, had, um, 
you know, Achilles surgery doesn't mean that I would be qualified to go and actually do that on you. Fair but point. education, for some reason, people say things like, you know, my education was this way, therefore we need this. And I'm like, wow, well, did you know that there are 332 million people in the U.S. that are not like you, uh, <laughs> you know, let alone nine or eight billion globally? So it's, it's this really interesting mix of things. Uh, education is as political as religion. And probably as volatile when you try to do things inside of it, people persecute, people are in absurd ways resistant. So they'll say things like, I have 1% pass uh, on standardized tests for my kids at the, you know, X middle school in mathematics, but yet they don't do anything differently than what they've done before, other than throwing labor at it, right? People, people, people. So COVID brought something interesting. Uh, one, it, it maybe jarred. Uh, the standard operating system for people to understand that school is the largest healthcare program in the world. It's the largest childcare program in the world. Mm -hmm. And it's also the largest food program in the world. Yes. Uh, people don't talk that way. They talk about you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic. No, this is parenting. School is about parenting in partnership with whatever uh, the actual parents look like. Mm -hmm. And if we don't talk that way, we're never going to get anything accomplished in society to get us past the uh, lottery of getting born into either privilege or not. Mm -hmm. So if we can parent in a particular way, then we know what it's like to raise thriving, healthy, healthy kids. And it surely is not sitting in classes, getting talked at daily lecture, never worked for anyone. And it doesn't build relationships. It certainly doesn't help us parent students. And it doesn't also help us do anything in terms of trauma informed care. Uh, lots of kids are getting, all sorts of trauma heaped on them yes. uh, from a very young age. Even great parents uh, who really work hard are, in fact, producing some sort of micro trauma for their kids. And yes. great people who also are well adapted and uh, for whatever reason, their relationship didn't work out and a divorce happened. Trauma, right? These are intelligent people. Can you imagine what the alternatives are and the things yes. that you would see if you work in public schools? Yeah, you're, you're just touching my heart. I mean, I live in a neighborhood on the near east side of Indianapolis. And um, when we moved in, the public school was failing by all accounts. It had a takeover. And so the only options for people that knew how to exercise their choices were to go outside of our neighborhood. And now our neighborhood is gentrifying. Yeah, the equity piece is just huge. And you see the kids whose parents don't have the resources to choose are stuck with what they got. And that should be absolutely unacceptable. Unacceptable. It should. And, and it's, it is true that resource, you know, both you choose to live in particular neighborhoods, yep. resource follows, the schools will improve. Mm -hmm. And the reason that they will improve is complex. Not only do you have more stable, high resourced families, mm -hmm. which the kids are raised in environments that have less trauma. Therefore, when they go to school, the school involves less trauma. Right. A less trauma filled school is always more productive. It doesn't matter what the kids look like in terms of race or anything else. If there is a, a lower level of trauma in the upbringing of these children in mass, yes. the school is going to be better. The opportunities yep. are going to be easier. Uh, they'll be easier to manage. But that changes jack it. squat for the little boy who has brown skin and mom works at a diner for tips. You got it. Like that does nothing for that poor child. So he didn't win the lottery. No, he did not. And so how do we improve schools? Well, COVID yes. gave us this opportunity. Yes. People stopped saying things like it's all about the school leader, right? So there's a 20-year a, a history in Indianapolis uh, or nationwide, really, of we've got to get better school leaders in charge of, of schools. That is awesome. I okay. completely agree. I'm also pretty proud of the fact that we have a per capita more school leaders of color in Indianapolis than in any other major city. Um, the Mind Trust and some of these other organizations made that happen. Okay. What we haven't figured out is that you have to operationalize the actual process of education, meaning what we're doing. So before we did a lot of things like we, we've always been trying to fix the idea of workforce, and we've always been trying to equitably provide private tutoring to everyone um, because private tutoring, when it's really well designed, works. It's one-on-one -on -one attention, it's relationship building, mm. it's interventions that are not lecture-based, right? It's sort of on-demand strategic interventions and just like building re relationships that matter. But it's completely inequitable because it would cost $80,000 per kid. We can't afford that. We can't hardly afford 10000 per kid, which mm -hmm. is kind of the, the state average on what we fund for public 
uh, education or private as parents would fund that themselves. So how did we do that? In the past, we used the idea that the best workforce in education is likely students. They're highly scalable, highly trainable. They have shared language with the other students. They're phenomenal at working together. Adults are the problem. So let's get out of their way. So we've done that for about 12 years uh, at every level from third graders through college students. And they're really good at it. And it really works. And it really scares the hell out of people when I say things like, by the way, college, you don't need lecture. And I sure as hell don't need a PhD in the room to learn something. <laughs> yes. um, that's just terrifying. <laughs> and, and actually real, right? Like it is yes. 100% true that you do not need a PhD in the room to learn something. And God forbid those guys are, uh, and gals are, are actually quite terrible at teaching and don't care, frankly. So yes. we, we have this narrative of, of peers and peer learning, peer tutoring, that, that blossoms into the idea of blended learning. Blended learning is basically me saying, hey, there's a whole bunch of different things that you can use to learn. How about I just, as your guide, schedule those things for you based on your needs. Like I'm going to get you some private tutoring. I'm going to get you some peer tutoring. I'm going to get you some, some adult instruction. You're going to work in some curriculum with some videos and stuff for a while, which collects a whole bunch of data. And then from the data and from your feedback, I'm going to get you a more customized experience. You know, how does that sound? And what COVID gave us the opportunity to do was actually do that. So when the entire education system was exposed for its absurd level of, uh, how do I say that with not too many negatives, completely and totally unagile. <laughs> There's no agility there at all. In fact, oh. they were trying to do lectures through Zoom. Like, could you imagine sitting with me waving a fedora for a bunch of kindergartners and trying to lecture on Zoom? What a colossal waste of time. Yes. Um, well, and not only that, I mean, you said, you. I mean, you said, what COVID revealed for us was that lectures, I mean, clearly didn't work, but it also helped us see, helped other people see the burden that we place on the school system that is not about the butt in that desk chair. It's about something yep. much deeper, more impactful, and probably more important on a child's life, especially Way those, more important. yes, especially those with trauma at home, parents that lack resources in multiple areas of their life, kids that lack resources. I mean, it got blown up. So assumptions just. Yeah. So great adversity, right. Is, yeah. is one, one way of thinking about it. Yeah. If you have sort of the mindset that I try to carry is great adversity can be a great opportunity because absolutely the sort of standard ways of operating have been disrupted. Uh, therefore new patterns can be created. Yes. That's kind of where we're at. Right. So it's kind of the way the brain works. Pattern. Yes. It, yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah, let's form some new habits that are more healthy. And also recognize that our society should not be based on retaining power, but rather equity. Yes. And for the first time, we we have an opportunity to know what. Preach, Kevin! Good I'm coming down the aisle on that. Say <laughs> that again for me. <laughs> we hit. I mean, we really have this opportunity, don't we? We mm -hmm. we have the high tech capability of of delivering, you know, almost any type of instruction, almost anywhere, and. The things we're working on are, are a part of this, right? So what if you wanted to be a classroom teacher, but you don't want to run a middle school in Gary, Indiana? Well, cool. I think you could plug into multiple classrooms with your expertise and teach all over the country in small snippets. Mm -hmm. And that's really all the kids need. You don't need to be in Gary managing that crew. There could, there could be people in Gary that are, and this is one of our departments that we run as a service is in Gary. Uh, because we've, because of COVID's disruption, we actually have launched and have now been running for close to a year uh, mathematics departments for schools in partnership with them. So they outsource the entire thing as a service. My team comes in and deploys a program that's the best math department on the market. And we do this to blended learning where we bring in people that basically you could be sitting on a beach in West Virginia and you could be teaching kids in Gary. The idea that we have a crisis of shortage of people that can teach math is ridiculous. Mm. There's people everywhere. We just don't give them the opportunity to actually use that expertise. Uh, and we, we really don't need them to sit up front and pontificate uh, for 55 minutes at a time. Like, whoever thought that worked? Because it doesn't. It actually is where fun goes to die. And uh, if we're <laughs> going to have... Uh, to <laughs> if we're we're going to just have kids from five to 18 and we're going to put them in an environment where fun dies every day 
And then we wonder why we graduate them and they can't think they're not autonomous. They're not, uh-huh. not, uh, you know, lustful for a joyful life. Like what the hell this is, we're getting what we deserve. Yeah. Um, amen. Well, so, so, ta- so the, yeah, I guess talk- the hot mess is how do you manage this? Right. So uh-huh. we have COVID, we had launched this thing that I think is incredibly practical, but is looked upon as incredibly radical. Mm. Uh, now we've scaled it across Indiana and it is really working. Like we have schools that are in low resource communities where their math department is keeping pace with the best schools in the in the state, which means the same math department that I would deploy in, in Zionsville is the exact same one that I would put in Fort Wayne or Gary mm-hmm. or Far East Indianapolis or Hawville, where my companies are located in Indianapolis. In fact, we are doing that. So how do we rectify that something is incredibly successful with the fact that we are being absurdly persecuted for that success mm. in in only in human systems like uh, government education religion are wildly successful operations persecuted or tried to 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 die kill whatever language you want to use there and so how do you balance that right society wants this they want us to be successful but the threat of success gives a natural uh, kind of set of fear. Uh, once fear sets in, logic is no longer available. So yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting problem to solve. So, well, so talk guess, to me, what does persecution look like to the business? Make that real for us. So you would get, uh, you'd have a conversation with a school who, mm-hmm. who has a pain, right? The pain is they, they can't hire math teachers. They've never been able to. The math teachers leave by October. The turnover rate is more than 50% every single year. They know this pain um, and they suffer from a mentality of, well, next year will be better. Okay. If we just um, smart candidates, we'll find the right one that can stick around. You're right. I just need that unicorn yes. because unicorns are like everywhere <laughs> and unicorns don't want to leave you when you overwork them and underpay them Mm -hmm. because they're unicorns and traumatize Uh, them in the process. But yeah, okay. (laughs) Which we do to teachers every day. We actually did a, we, uh, a quick aside on that. We ran a a research study and we figured out that what we ask classroom teachers to do is about 120 hours a week of actual work. So we ask Mm -hmm. them to work three full-time jobs, Mm -hmm. pay them kind of, for one eight Ish. month contract yeah, and then wonder why the hell they're pissed all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so w- when we did that research, what we figured out is, is uh, uh, who we should focus on with our work for the math department as a service, which is called XR math. Okay. We have XR CS, we have XR reading now that we've, we've launched and are scaling across Indiana. What we focus on is how do we make the teacher as happy as possible? If I can get really happy teachers, like these people are, are the, really wonderful humans in our society, mm-hmm. right? And and we've actually beat the hell out of them. Uh, a lot of them are in other industries now and they want to go back, but they don't want to get beat up again. And so if I can remove all the things that are a burden to her, right? Nobody needs to grade papers, give quizzes, tet- like why the hell do we do that? We have How many times has homework that. been proven not to work by the way? And yet we Enough. still- <laughs> Sorry, that's my own. Yeah, you're right. So practice is important, but we can do practice in other ways. We don't yes. need the classroom teacher to be sitting at her house with, uh, you know, a glass of Merlot grading people's papers subjectively <laughs> yes. uh, while her kids or spouse or whatever are running around. Yes. Like, none of that's useful. Uh, it's definitely not great for data. It's definitely not good on the teacher because her job should be loving kids and helping uh, in one way, shape, or form, um, decrease the burden of parenting on the rest of the ecosystem that surrounds that kid. Yes. Right? So, so, so back to the persecution, because I want I want people to understand what this feels like, what this tension feels like, because then it's going to speak to the resilience that's needed to get through the hard time. So persecution. So you said meetings with principals that are coming in with a mindset of we just got to hire a unicorn. What else, what, what, what else does that pressure feel like on you, your staff, your organization? So I have a really talented team who have, are donated um, basically time, effort, energy, but also their, their lives uh, to, I said donated, it should be, um, you know, they, they've dedicated themselves to this. Mm. I'm sure they've donated some too. <laughs> they have. They have. We're, we are entirely a charitable organization. Uh, these, these talented people have definitely uh, worked harder than I'm 
uh, I would say other groups would ask them to do. The persecution is this. We've created something through sheer will that really works. It really works. Um, we have an entire math department in Gary, Indiana, that are an all African-American men. Show me another department that has done that, yes. that is getting the numbers that we are getting. Yes. And I'll basically call you a liar. So this really works. We've asked national organizations like the Gates Foundation and others, Do you, have you ever seen anything like this? Because they funded us. The answer is no. Cool. So when we go to a school leader and we say, this is what we can do. And they say, well, wh what do you mean they work for you? Well, the department, it's just like general contracting in, in, a, in a construction. Like you bring in the electricians, you bring in the cement, you bring in the drywallers. They all work for individual companies, but it's your project. And I either get, wow, that's really cool. Or I get, there's no way that would work here. Mm -hmm. And when I, I hear no way that would work here, what they hear is I'm going to run your school for you. Yes. Which is not true. We're not trying to do that at all. What we're trying to do is to give you, you have to hire one-off teachers to run a department. One-off teachers are independent operating systems that don't really make a team, it, regardless of what anybody says. That is not how it works at a school. Uh, these teachers close their doors and they do their thing. We, we are, we're a team. We work together and we service the entire student population for exactly what they need, uh, you know, in, in that process. And we do that within the culture of the school, which when a principal here is, you never have to hire a math teacher again. The first thing they say is, oh, thank God. <laughs> <He is>, <laughs> <you know. laughs> These math people, they're shit to be around. You know, I'll, I'm, You're like, I know I used to be one. <laughs> I'm, I'm a math person. That sucks. Um, but I get you, right? Uh, you know, uh, and then and then they say they say these absurd things like, well, I just I, I don't this is probably not for me. I feel like I would lose my school. And I'm like, you've already lost your school. Mm -hmm. Your 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 rates of, of uh, passing tests, which I don't care about tests, but we're accountable to them as a system mm -hmm. until policy shifts. Otherwise, you have one percent, one kid. If I lined up 100, one of them would be able to step forward and have a success. You told 99 kids they were a failure. That's not. That's not a team. That's not success. That's not your school. Mm -hmm. That is a failure uh, of epic proportion. And it's happening in every single school uh, in low resource communities. I mean, and then the principals are, are fighting this Herculean battle. Like they, they just don't have a team. Mm -hmm. they, they cannot create the team that they need. So, mm. you know, kind of circling back to what I said before, I'm proud that we have these leaders in place in these schools. That's awesome. You can't be a great coach on a team that has no players, right? So right. who they can hire and piece together that doesn't leave them never makes a solid team for them. What we're trying to do is attack that. And we're not anti-teacher. Hell, we hire teachers, right? Mm -hmm. And we, we pay them well to execute a job that makes them really happy. Does that sound like anti-teacher? Like we love them. We're not anti-union. We love people organizing and trying to get a better life. By the way, that's what we built. We mm -hmm. want teachers to be happy. But people say things like, well, you're a for-profit company. Yes, my company I created is a for-profit company. We have a nonprofit foundation. You know what the nonprofit does? It raises money to seed grants into schools so that we pay for half of an operation just to let you get out of your own way and, and um, you know, consider risk or help you manage risk. Mm -hmm. So our, our foundation has always raised money to basically seed innovation in schools because the answer no is so simple to say but if i'm like well check it out you know i can i can seed this a little bit we can pay for half of this program just give it a shot because once you see it in operations you're not going to want to go back we get pretty mm -hmm. sticky pretty quick but we are for profit we have to be agile we have to be and respond to the pains of our clients we have to continue to make our product move better um, we have to scale it we have to grow we have to hire awesome people and operationalize what they do. Nonprofits that get grants to go do professional development or something like that, they don't have to be agile for anything. Mm -hmm. They have to go and deploy what they wrote a grant for two years ago. That's right. That is that is a complete lack of agility. And there is no way that that scales or impacts education the way that we want. Mm -hmm. um, there's 57 million kids in the U.S. education system right now. That nonprofit mentality of, you know, do a thing and get funded to do a thing that's never going to work. It hasn't worked. Yeah. We've spent billions of dollars trying to professionally develop ourselves out of this. Yeah. Now, well, everything I a, just said just pissed off about 400 people. So 
I would say I want to add a layer to that because as a person who started out with a master's degree in nonprofit management, wanted to dedicate my career to that. I can tell folks from experience, there's a lot of lack of accountability in the nonprofit world that on the for-profit side, you have to have because you have to have cash to keep going That's right. and you have to do things that people want on the nonprofit side. That's not always true. You have to do things that funders want you can measure outcomes in a variety of ways to make them look good. I mean, the last really? grant I ever managed for a nonprofit made me want to throw that piece of paper across the room. I got chewed out by this grant officer. I had an intern make me spend three extra hours of work because she had one question. I was like, how is this helping anybody? This is bullshit. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's not. And, and I, I actually- Not to minimize the whole system, but there's lots of experiences like that you you have to make things you have to grow things mm -hmm. and you if you don't do those well you die that's mm -hmm. the for-profit mentality mm -hmm. the non-profit mentality i had to experience this myself to your point with your experiences mm -hmm. um, i had to remediate my understanding so i joined a bunch of non-profit boards because i'm passionate about it but i had to understand the capacity of community centers i had to understand the capacity mm -hmm. of a non-profit mm -hmm. how do they operate and the idea of selling a story is way different than actually executing something that will promote real change in the world. Yes. We we are, again, to our very beginning of our conversation, we're trying to make stuff. And if that means that I don't have time to tell stories, you know, Robert Bain will, will omit with me, but that's probably an indicator that we're kind of kicking ass. That's right. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so how do you tell the story, you know, it, so we circle back to it. But so the, the, the persecution is uh, people are like, well, this is, you're, you're predatorizing the education system. Like, Hell no, I'm not. Twelve and a half billion dollars are spent every year on shit results. Mm. That is a predator happening right now. You can't throw labor at this. It's not going to fix it. But you're going to spend that twelve and a half billion a year in yes. Indiana alone on basically zero outcomes or deliverables. Mm. Okay. So when I go in and I have monthly deliverables where we're showing that kids can actually do complex mathematics way better than they were previously. That's that's being a predator. Uh, we're not spending any more money. You guys are paying us exactly what you would have paid a classroom teacher that couldn't do half the shit that we do. So how do we manage that expectation or that that conversation? How do you remediate those things? What you know, you want to define hot mess. We're we're getting defined by our success or persecuted by our success. And the the bigger we get and the more success we have the more a certain population of people hate us. Of course. Because it's like, well, geez, they, these guys have made millions of dollars off of, off of kids. I'm like, well, that's, that's stupid. <laughs> that's not what we're doing at all. Uh, in fact, we're driving I love that great that, value. I was going to say, I love that that fits into a Facebook post. Let's dig into that a little bit and see what's going on. <laughs> Lots of people make millions of dollars off of kids. Let's check that. Oh, man. I mean, you're throwing the gauntlet down on a very serious problem. I love this. This season of the Hot Mess Hotline is brought to you by my Hot Mess Quiz. One of the common lessons that my clients learn during coaching is how to really evaluate a problem, dissect it for clarity, and then take action on the tasks that really move the needle. The Hot Mess Quiz can bring you that focus too. As a leader, your work life is full of, well, work. But according to Pareto, 80% of that work isn't even impactful. If you need to create growth and change, you need to focus in on what truly matters and what will drive new results. Take the hot mess quiz by clicking on the link below, which is stephaniecrevins.com forward slash hot mess quiz. You know, just like this podcast promise, and this is in the real world too, what happens when people stop being polite and start getting real? That's what you're going to get in this report. It's going to be tailored to your business hot mess to tell you exactly where to focus your efforts first and then how to bring your team along to get the change that you need to create. Go to stephaniecrevins.com forward slash hot mess quiz. Don't wait another minute to start becoming the pro troublemaker you've always wanted to be. Talk to me about how you as a CEO, the, the, the leader of this, of this cause that's bringing equity to communities uh, across Indiana and the, in, in the world, how do you stay centered 
maybe level-headed isn't, I'm not going to ask you to be level-headed, but how do you stay centered, focused on what's really important when the labels get thrown at you because you're challenging the status quo? I've experienced the same thing. I mean, there is a violent verbal backlash that happens when you touch people's egos in just the right spot. It is I I had my own zombie moment. I remember I questioned an executive director when I was on staff. And I remember I call it the zombie moment because all six faces in the room turned to look at me like, did you just (laughs) fucking say that? (laughs) And I was like, and I'm out. I'm out. This is not my place to make a difference. I am out. (laughs) So for you, Kevin, yeah. Oh, I don't tow no lines. Um, That's why I'm a coach. (laughs) But how do you stay focused, centered on who you are as a person, what the business is here to do when that stuff comes raining down? So I think you have to, you have to understand what the job of a CEO is. Okay. So in, in my, my opinion, I'm, I'm here to make teams. So yes, I brought ideas and vision to this space, but if I don't have a team wrapped around me that is highly capable and equally motivated to do this work, Uh, then we get nowhere, right? We don't get operations. Ideas are not businesses. Ideas are things that need to be beat up by really smart people to get them into a product that you can then sell and scale. So anybody that says that they're an entrepreneur because they have ideas is full of shit. You're not an entrepreneur until you figure out that businesses have value, ideas don't. Mm -hmm. Um, There's plenty of great ideas out there that will never become businesses because you can't make any money doing them. Lament or not, that's a fact, right? Uh, if you can't create margin and, and build teams around something, supposedly that's what the nonprofit space is supposed to supply is that gap. Uh, I don't see that happening, unfortunately. But, you know, that's probably a different podcast. So if... I don't disagree, but that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so how, do, how, do I, how do I keep balance? Well, uh, I have asked people to risk their lives, careers, and basically their, their way of operating on, on a vision that used to live in my head and has now been operationalized. Mm -hmm. So how do I remain positive? Well, one way to remain positive is that is a beautiful thing. Mm. You have created a team of humans that have the ability to harmonize uh, the way that we build teams. We're looking for harmonizing, if you think about it any way you want, but brains harmonize. Mm. And diversity increases the harmonization because it increases the robustness. Like we have assets that know how to handle particular issues better than others. And we we sort of equitably push that talent to do such things, right? There's no like, it's Kevin's way or whatever. It's we have a team. So I've asked some very talented people that come from industries that typically don't work in education to come and, and join a team. So it's very beautiful if you stand back and look at it, what you're asking people to do. It is very hard to do this work in an education space that is highly political, among other things. Mm-hmm. My second job as a CEO is to be the whipping point point for that abuse. Me as either a person, like not Kevin that would hang out with you and and, uh, have a cup of coffee on a couch, but Kevin, the CEO has to take the, the, the front of the abuse so that Mm. everybody else can do the work. You get accolades and other things too, right? Like people Mm -hmm. say great things about you in press. Uh, They also say shitty things when they want to, but the front of that and the sort of the energy that's coming in, you have to be that, that blocker so that everyone else can do what they need to do in the process. It's incredibly easy to think that you are awesome and that you are way more awesome than you actually are. (laughs) Uh, So so you have to create structure Uh so that you continuously question whether or not you are arrogant compared to confident. Being a CEO requires confidence. If you're an arrogant CEO, your company will die pretty soon. There's a balance you have to find between those things. Uh, I don't think anybody that's being honest has ever figured it out perfectly, but if you are trying to, then you're onto something. And if you have teams that continue to grow and people want to work for you, not in the way that some of the big growing companies are, which is you pay for talent because you have loads and loads and loads of money, but it's that you can attract talent to a cause and culture of a company because the the cause is just, the vision is good, and the people that harmonize with you are really talented, good people. Mm -hmm. Um, You're onto something. Who you build as a team needs to keep you as the leader of that in check at all times. And I, also just sort of emotionally balanced too, because mm-hmm. it sucks to be a whipping post. That's part of what you have to do. Yeah. And I feel but, you on that. 
Well, I was, you know, for my team, I always try to praise their good work when it's good and great. And I expect good and great work almost all the time for myself. What I, you'll hear me saying, cause I try to stay humble yet confident, but not arrogant. Cause my ego is wants to lend itself towards arrogance. Sometimes as sure. my husband will tell you, <laughs> we, all we, right? we all do. It takes some ego to like put yourself out here like this to be a CEO for sure and to gain the power that you do have in the influence. But what I try to do, what I try to do for myself is be like, oh, that was good because that keeps me like, because there's always an opportunity to make it better. There's always an opportunity to make it great. So the things that I produce, I'm like, mm, that was good. Next time I'll do it better. So maybe it'll be great because that that's my mind trick to remember like, it's probably not that great. It probably is okay. You know, what's that study where if you ask people if you're on a range from like okay or average, below average, above average, 80% of all people think they're above average on almost everything, which is yeah, you're in math, you know, statistically not possible. <laughs> if I know what average means, um, but I mean, that's fascinating. And it's a great opportunity to remind us to check our own ego in whatever role that we're in. Yeah, so that I, that resonates completely. Uh, <laughs> you know, we we uh, we have to balance. So what you'll hear if you were here with with my teams is uh, what constantly comes out of my mouth is thank you for your work. Mm. What also o- often comes out of my mouth is this isn't good enough yet. I'm perfectly capable of uh, heaping that criticism on myself, as anyone mm-hmm. I think would probably tell you. But mm-hmm. uh, nothing that we do is good enough. So when we continue to advance at a pace uh, where others tell stories and talk about how awesome they are, but we're actually that awesome with the actual operations, we're keeping Mm -hmm. pace with other people's stories. That sense of urgency uh, will push you to be excellent. Yes. Um, I I think I learned that maybe recently in the last couple of years was uh, one of my other, um, I have a portfolio of companies that I manage and uh, one of the presidents of one of the companies, I, we had a eureka moment and we were like, shit, we're, we're actually outpacing people's stories that aren't doing anything. And, and, you know, like when you get this like raise round that comes out in the IBJ and I raised X amount for this, so most of that's bullshit. And it's once you get to a place where you've done all of that and then you can kind of smell it, you're like, Oh my God, we were we were running at the pace of everybody else that was faking it. What a, what a crazy, crazy mm-hmm. thing to have to deal with. So uh-huh. if you do keep pace and, and have a sense of urgency like that, and you've built the right team, the things that you can create are beautiful. So Kevin, what do you want mid-level leaders listening to this who maybe want to be in your seat one day or want to found their own thing one day, or just want to raise above their level that they're currently in? What do you want them to know about what it means and what it takes to be in your shoes? I think you have to understand risk, which sometimes risk is only uh, understood by doing. But the risk that you are undertaking to do something on your own means that financially you could ruin yourself pretty fast. You can ruin a family life very fast. Mm -hmm. It depends on what your goals for family are. My goals have always been that my family life would be as important as anything else that I've done. And, you know, dad, husband, job. I wanted to be the best at those three things in equal ways. But it turns out that being an entrepreneur really limits your ability to be great at some of the people things in your lives because Mm -hmm. there is no clock that you can, you know, punch out. You don't, you don't get to ignore text messages on the weekends. You, if you have, like I have with more than 50 people working with us, you're constantly having to battle uh, people being people and businesses being businesses and cash flow being cash flow and risk and burden and debt and investments. And then once you get invested in, you got to understand that your investors are now driving your car, you know, stuff like that. So understanding those things, it it isn't a fairy tale. Uh, It isn't all pleasant by any stretch. It is beautiful if you think and see beauty the way that I do. Humans working on something together you know, as simple, I'm the type of person, for example, that in, if you were to go to a Colts game, you know, pre COVID and everybody cheers at the same time, like parts of my body melt because that's all humans on a same wavelength. Like that is just the coolest thing. If you see that beauty, then being an entrepreneur is beautiful. If you can't manage risk and the type of risk that would typically crush normal people, um, it's, it is not for you. 
And no matter how good of an idea you think you have, that's going to make you a billionaire, it's going to take you six years just to make money, Mm -hmm. you know, unless you're just incredibly unicorn fortunate, which happens once in a hundred million, you know, times. Yes. So, So those things are really important for people to understand. It takes a level of perseverance and relentlessness that is not for the faint of heart. That's right. right. Yes. Getting, getting said no to is a not yet thing. And if you can't transfer that language to no is not yet, then you don't need to be an entrepreneur because you're going to get said no to thousands of times. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, and, and it's likely true as you age with this expertise that it, there's a good reason you're being said no to because your stuff is, is shit. Um, <laughs> it wasn't that good. You thought it was good because you're a delusional entrepreneur, which you have to be but it isn't. And someday it will be good, but you've got to outpace the, uh, the, the crappy product stuff, um, which oh, yeah. inevitably the mistakes you have to make, right? I always pitch a product or a program at least four times, five times before I actually get someone to buy a version of what my idea was five proposals ago. So like the first time I've gotten to the point, I'm like, oh, this is the first time I get to pitch this idea. I hope they say no, because then I get to do it again. And then I'll figure <laughs> out what I'm actually fucking doing here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <clears throat> that's why your slide deck changes because you don't right. have the language yet until somebody says no to you. <laughs> You're like, oh, that They're was like, I, this isn't for me. And I'm like, well, it should be for you. So tell me more. <laughs> what? <laughs> Oh, you wanted instructional guidance system instead of learning management. Oh, okay, cool. Well, I yeah, hate okay. this. <laughs> <You know? laughs> know, right? But that's what you got to do, right? Language oh, matters. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And, <laughs> and oh my your gosh. product evolves accordingly. So, um, yeah, those are the things. I, I, I just, I think man, woman that tries to do this, you have to understand what your goals are in terms of balance. Um, I talk to a lot of, so I, I believe in networking. Um, I believe in the power of it. I believe in asking people and being vulnerable mm-hmm. um, and not really caring that I don't know everything mm-hmm. because what, what are you going to do? You're going to make fun of me because uh, I don't know how to run a, 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 and scale a big company. Like that's a pretty f- small subset of humans that know how to do that. Mm-hmm. So I, being vulnerable and asking questions, what I learned over the years was I asked a lot of men, can you balance being an entrepreneur with being a good family person? And almost to the, the number, the answer was no. Correct. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, fuck, that, that's something I want to do. And yeah. I really want to do this business thing. So I'm going to prove that I can do it. Mm-hmm. And I, I think the resounding results is that you can do some of it, right? You can still be a tremendous dad uh, and probably a tremendous husband. Uh, I won't claim that uh, I've ever achieved that level of of stardom in in, uh, in my relationships. That's but. the next episode with your family. Let's see what they say. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Um, but you can work really hard at it as mm-hmm. in partnership and concert with, but you have to give everything to being an entrepreneur or you will not be successful and mm-hmm. you could bankrupt yourself, your family and people that you care about that gave you friends, family and fools money to go do your thing. Uh, so you have to, you have to really know that and, and own it. Yeah, uh, And if you're wildly successful, you build a, a complete wealth, but you might be living in the house by yourself. Mm-hmm. Is that cool? You know that you, you have to understand that that's part of the risk that you're taking as well. Yeah. I met, I met an entrepreneur who is a former husband and a current dad. And he was saying he had to give it all for this tech company. You know, he made some deals with his now ex-wife to make that happen. And I talked to him after he, so he was giving this presentation about it. So his company sold to exact target, exact target sold to Salesforce, which is, you know, Indiana legend around here. And, um, you know, that is an amazing feat. I don't want to undermine that. And when I asked him, I was like, how does your wife feel about your lifestyle now? He's like, Oh, we got divorced. I was like, did you win? Like, did you, man, I'm going to say no on my end. And it's a question that you have to ask, like, what does it mean to win? Because, Mm -hmm. you know, relationships, aren't just up to the entrepreneur. We can control a lot of things when it comes to the business because Mm -hmm. nobody questions you if you want to operate. You make decisions and we go and the Mm -hmm. team coalesces around these visions and decisions. Relationships don't work that way, it turns Mm -mm. out. Uh, You have to have a a bridge and a partnership and you cannot control another person's actions in a particular way and they get to make decisions about leaving your ass. Like that's Mm -hmm. that's the thing. You know, employees quit, but it's different. Uh, it is way different. Yes. So, so you have to balance that too. I think you have to really understand that your kids don't care that you're a successful entrepreneur. They don't. No. 
if you're a millionaire or a billionaire, they really don't care. Are you, are you an involved dad? Do you yes. care about the fact that um, they really like this particular type of Pokemon? I've got a nine, six and three year old. And I know for a fact that no matter how successful I am, they will never care uh, if I am a shitty dad. Yeah. And, I have this theory that the more successful you are as an entrepreneur, the better uh, rehab you can buy for your kids uh, because you neglected them. I mean, not to be completely disgusting, but that sometimes that's what it comes down to is, oh, wow, you made more money. Your kids don't know your middle name. You get to buy them a better rehab when they're 16. Yeah, the kids, no, that's, it's, you not gotta good. Be, it's not good. You gotta be involved and, and mm -hmm. uh, you got to understand that yeah. it's, it's a risk on, on a lot of different levels. If wildly successful, the payoff is not what people think it is. So mm -hmm. wild wealth with no happiness, who wants that? But the, the beautifulness that I see is that that coalescing of teams around a, a united vision. That's a great way to spend your work week. Yeah. And, um, I, can, I, can, I can wrap my mind around doing that for quite a few more years until I go to a beach and buy two tighter shorts and sit in the sun for a while. <laughs> That'll be the day. I love that you said yeah. that about teams and I'll let you go. But so I always wear, I, I love the start of the pride parade and we go to the one here in Indianapolis. I always wear sunglasses, <laughs> not because it's June, but because I'm crying at mm. the happiness and the joy and the, that, that folks who are very different than me that I know spend a lot of time hiding who they are in public, get to live it out completely in public. The fact that they get to do that for this parade just makes me sob. So thank you for sharing that because I also do that and I never tell anybody. I'm like, I have to wear my sunglasses because I'm just so happy for their happiness. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's interesting. That's that's an interesting way of putting it. I suppose that the teams that you build as an entrepreneur are getting a chance to live out something that they don't typically get to live out, which is a mm -hmm. balance between what they're passionate about. If you are in a, a business like what I am, mm -hmm. where lots of people are passionate about education, but they can actually make money and do what they are passionate about and be on a team that values them mm -hmm. um, in some way, shape or form. If, if you tear up in, in the ways that you talked about, you would you would feel the same kind of glow uh, with your day to days as a CEO of something like that. That's a yes. real big payoff. Right? That's huge. Yeah. Yes. So. Yes. Great. Oh, all right, my friend. It's great to meet you and have this conversation. Thank you yeah, for sharing Hopefully this. Hopefully it was valuable. Oh, fantastic. All right, my friend, give it up for Dr. Kevin Burke Hopes with Crossroads Education, throwing the gauntlet down on scaling equity speaking truth to power and the impact of this. So I want to leave you with my takeaways that I hope that you will journal on, noodle on, reflect on, and take them into your role as you advance in not only a current title, but a whatever title and wherever your career takes you in the future. One, an idea is not a business. It is simply an idea. You've got to figure out how to make money with it, which means that you've got to figure out how to adapt it so that people want to actually pay you for it. This is the entrepreneurial journey of every single company. There is no such thing as an overnight success. Every company starts with something probably even worse than a minimally viable product until you see it, right? Number two, no equals not yet. If you can't hear no and bounce back from that, maybe you're not equipped for more and more leadership because for those of us who are successful in the short term and long term, we know that no equals not yet. Did you hear how Kevin stays centered and balanced in his role? He said, I separate out myself from being a CEO from the other roles that I play in this world as a human, as a father, as a dad. He knows and has defined what it means for him to be a CEO of his company, and he steps in and out of that role. Don't be a CEO at home. That's not your job. Your job at home is to be with your significant other, to be with your children, to be with your loved ones, to be with your family of choice or family of origin, right? We have to separate out those roles to stay centered and focus on what's important in the moment so that we can step into CEO mode, to be that decision maker, to be a results oriented leader, to be that team player you need to be. And then you step out of it when it's applicable, when, it, when it's the important and right thing to do. The next one was diversity increases robustness. Friends, the data and the science already shows this. Kevin is proving it at Crossroads, but a diverse perspective increases the robustness, the strength, the resiliency of a company because of 
the different perspectives, the different trains of thoughts, the way, the different ways of accomplishing the same work. So remember, diversity increases robustness. All right, my friend, now let's be a pro troublemaker that gets off the internet, gets the real work done, and I'll see you next time.